trick. This isn't my music. Okay, that actually was my music. That's so funny. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. come together so thank you so much um, just quickly you know the bathrooms if you just go out into the foyer um, there's double silver doors um, fill your boots if there's a fire alarm which he sold to Disney, and Ultra Mirror, which he sold to Microsoft. So this, it's an AUT, um, 3rd of December, 5.30, there's some tickets there, and it's going to go to the best question, and I might get Vaughan to choose the best question at the time to get this one. I'm giving you a job, thank you very much. Um, we've also got, actually, Dan, did you want to come up with a quick chat about? Oh. About just the business of it? Or do you want me to do it for you? <laughs> 
Jan is one of our speaker organizers, um, the members. She's going to meet with me as well. Yeah, um, I just want to take the opportunity, just a few seconds, to invite everyone to the Digital Business Summit. Um, I will pick the best three tweets, and you will get a free um, it's a virtual conference, so it is going to be a webinar. We do have. sponsoring the event and for all the attendees actually of the DBS or Digital Business Summit, they will get a three month free pass for the Pro Plan plus Hootsuite University. So for Smackle, because of committee member, and we love you guys, social community here in Auckland, um, we're offering it for just 10 bucks US um, if you just um, put the coupon in Smackle 10. Now to win, Tweet the night with the hashtags, and then I'll try to monitor it with my team back actually in Manila. Um, and we'll pick the best tweets of the month. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. And of course, we're at Vodafone, and we happen to have the Vodafone New Zealand Music Awards tomorrow night. And I've got three tickets here. Um, so I think we might do a slightly unsocial way of giving these out tonight. I'm seeing some people in red, which I quite like. Um, but I also thought maybe we could have a bit of a pop quiz and the first person to get this right with their hand or maybe my feet, I can't see it so we're going to do it by hand, um, gets these three tickets to take you on two mates. So I think the question could be, um, who knows who the hosts are of the Vodafone New Zealand Music Awards are tomorrow? Yeah. Correct. Oh, well done. <laughs> Radio, one other little thing we have before we get completely started, which is super cool, and at the Smackle, is we have a thing, a little section called the Shiny New Thing. And it's a new, um, something new that's come onto the scene that we think is pretty awesome. This time we've got something a little bit different, and I'm going to bring Ashley Lennon to come up and talk about a... It's very cool. I'll let, I'll let her explain. Welcome, Ashley. Hello, lovely Smackle people. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about the Shiny New Thing, which comes in a can this month. And it's very shiny indeed. It's got some helpful information on the front of it. Um, it's a natural cola, which Charlie's had launched about a week and a half ago. They decided to give it a bash. Lots of delicious stuff in there. And what we're actually doing is we want you guys tonight, there's about a small tripod out there, so help yourself to a can. <laughs> Um, we're getting you to get onto our Facebook page and actually vote and tell us if you like it. All good if you don't, let us know that as well. But if you do, um, your vote's going to count towards potentially making another batch of this stuff. So head onto our Facebook page, cast your vote, have your say, um, upload a photo of yourself as well if you want, give it a thumbs up or maybe turn the cat down if you didn't quite like it. Um, and yeah, in about two, three and a half weeks' time, we'll let you know if we're going to make another batch. Or whatever it was. Um, we all had fake names, and used to, like, I, had a, I had a girlfriend too, she met a guy online and got married to him through an anonymous chat room. 
But back there, that's what happened. Now, last sort of five to seven years, we're all quite happy with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat. Put our names and our faces to what's happening, um, to what our comments are on, on social media. But now, if you look at what's happening, the other day I found some crazy stats, and it's something like um, 100 hours of YouTube every hour, or every minute are uploaded, and 350,000 tweets, and um, millions of Facebook posts. The question is, are we actually sharing too much? I mean, I've, you know, Kim Kardashian shared quite a lot last week, let's be honest. <laughs> um, so, there's a lot of sharing going on, and is there, is, there's too much happening. There's also been a bit of a 90s relapse, I reckon, with um, Whisper, Secret, Facebook rooms coming in, which are quite anonymous again. And I'm not sure if they've still got pick up yet, but they, they might come back. Um, but maybe, maybe it is. So we've got a panel here from all walks of life, so we're going to have some really interesting insights um, about what would happen if we actually start, for some reason, start sharing this, or what, what we share is less trackable. So I'm going to sort of start off with a big obvious question to kind of everyone, but it's like, do we actually share, should we be sharing as much as we do share online? Um, are we oversharing? Does it matter? And I was thinking, people, could you start? Because you've got the most tweets when I looked at everyone's things. I think you should be on. Dylan, is it working? Do I have to push something? Oh, it doesn't like you. social media is that you can filter what you see and who it's from. Um, I think it can get overwhelming. Oh, shit. I think it's awesome. <laughs> Let's hear that. I'm not. <laughs> um, for me, personally, I do follow quite a lot of people, but it's overwhelming because I don't look at it that much. I don't go through anything necessarily. Actually, okay, I don't think it's me. I don't think that it's me. <laughs> <laughs> stories. Um, although I have to say um, this whole notion of uh, are we oversharing is a bit redundant. I mean New Zealand was a test bed for FPOST. If you're worried about big data, uh, what the hell is your bank going there? Because they know exactly how much you drink, how late you're staying up, and how bad you are at budgeting. Um, so, so really I think this concern over Facebook is probably somewhat misplaced. I mean flyby, it's goodness to me, flyby, everyone wants those ridiculous rewards. What is it, 0.1 cent? And really, it's just a huge marketing tool, again, to suck up exactly what you're buying. Um, but online, I mean, you're, you have to assume that it's effectively a public square. Um, if you think uh, you can tick a privacy box and things will be safe, <laughs> have I got news for you? I mean, <laughs> what I do, if someone uh, only shares stuff with their friends, you find out who their friends are and break one of them, right? Um, and of course, and who really knows all their 500 Facebook friends, really? Really, you, you don't think one of them would talk to me and let me borrow their account for 10 minutes? Because that happens. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, just, I mean and, and how much how much crap have you left on the net? I mean, really, how many people have uh, have signed up for like Hell Pizza accounts 
and have forgotten the password. It's, you've got your credit card details on there. That's hilarious. Old friends. Old friends is great because people put their birth dates in. So, they, so, you know, your age is always right. I've put so many people out on that. They claim they're younger, they're not. Yeah, it's, it's a good time. So, no, 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 I'm not sure too much. Please keep it up, everyone. It's wonderful. <laughs> so, so, Rick, um, should we be teaching ourselves a little bit from Mitch, or what would you suggest? <laughs> That's hard. Hello, isn't it? Um, I do know my 500 friends, and you're not one of them. <laughs> and I, I was around in the 90s, but I don't remember. Um, I wasn't sharing a great deal at that stage. Um, I'm going to confound the critics and say, as a lawyer, yes, share the shit out of it. Um, <coughs> what I really do think, though, is that there needs to be more granularity around what happens to the information once it's shared. And I unfortunately do agree with Matt that ticking the box, despite my writing of 30 page, 35 odd pages of legal gobbledygook that no one reads is pretty much a waste of time, isn't it? I mean, it's not informed consent, that's what it's meant to be, privacy and so on is around informed consent, but it ain't. So we need a lot better method of informing people what actually happens to the information once we share it. Let's not throw the sharing baby out with the bathwater because people misuse the information once we've shared it. Let's attack the problem, which is about how the information is shared, and that's where I think we should be focusing our attention. Okay, that's quite, that's quite an interesting way to, to look at it. So instead of, so just keep sharing basically, but look at where that information is going? Yeah, I mean, you, you obviously, hey, let's not, let's be realistic. Let's all expect that Matt is going to <laughs> troll all of our accounts <laughs> and put it on the internet, that, that thing that puts stuff around, pipes or something. Uh, let's, let's expect that. Let's expect it on the front page of every social network. So if you, if you expect that, then you can take your own precautions. But what I'm saying is, don't let that chill the beauty of the internet to have us sharing information, whether it be in the commercial context or in particular in the education sector, where we tell our kids, share, share, share. And then as they grow older, we tell them, for God's sake, don't share. Now that's a bad answer. It sounds like a big, a big issue though. It's not something like, do you think it's a like, person can do? Or is it something that you actually need like a government or a uh, culture shift? Governments work pretty slowly. Yeah. Laws work pretty slowly. So we need a return to social netiquette, effectively. <laughs> social rules, social uh, ethics, in a sense. And we need to teach that to our children. Yeah, which brings us to our, sort of our next point. Like we've all seen when sharing goes bad. Oh, hold on one second. Just interrupting myself. Yeah, you can't use me without strain. So I knew I'd do something like that. See we go. Where's the treasure? It's right behind you. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Now I feel feel like we're we're, we're a proper snackle now we've got that behind us. Um, so we've all seen, seen a time where social sharing hasn't gone probably quite as the person intended to. Um, like the All Blacks, Snapchat, chat, they got that sort of stuff. Now I thought it would be quite interesting to talk to you guys about, from your in different industries and different point of views, where things have actually gone wrong and maybe how you would have prevented or dealt with it or in some sort of way, looked at something I'll, different. I'll start off with a, a small anecdote from last week. Um, so social media, Twitter, you know, you, you do have to be a little bit careful. There's this thing, there are these things called direct messages, meant to be private apparently. Um, if you don't DM someone and you accidentally publicly send it, then that can be a bit of a problem, as I found out last week. Victoria Young, if you're here, thank you. Um, so yeah, things could go wrong. Social media, we all knew it when you know people told us that email was very immediate and you had to be careful. Social media, I think, exacerbates that, so you do need to be a little bit more careful, as I found out. So, um, yeah, and you can, you can, you know, you can overshare in the sense that you need to understand how these things are going to be portrayed and where they're going to go to. Mm -hmm. And that's what I say about drinking out. Know. Okay, so, um, 
Yeah, when I talk about us dealing with personal data to strip mine of stories, I mean, I only do this for the greater good, of course. I mean, so there's, I just want to give a couple of examples of our times where, like, where subjects, my stories, have shared more than they want to, but I think uh, the public was served uh, with what was exposed. Now, there was a, during the, the finance company debacle, there was a, a chief executive there, um, Rob Alloway, uh, he ran Allied Farmers and um, had quite a lot of involvement in Allied Nationwide to big companies have fallen down. And, and six months before Allied Nationwide fell over, I think it resulted in a bailout of a taxpayer of about 300 million bucks, um, he was racing Porsches around Pukekohe. Now, I only, I only discovered this because uh, he had an unlocked Facebook page. He only had about 30 friends, it was obviously just for his family and the like. But he had, a, he had this massive collection of Porsches listed there in his photo gallery. It was amazing. And even better, he had a Porsche. A Porsche that he was racing in some, some amateur series. And it was... Uh, sponsored by his finance company. So he had, he had a Porsche 911 racing around Pukekohe with a, a nationwide, sorry, national finance logos on the side. And this is six months before the company went under. Clearly it was in serious trouble at the time. I think there was a, 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 a large square sort of public interest there. And um, the other example was, again, this is the one I was directly referring to, where, you know, if you tick that, uh, only my friends can see this. Uh, this was a, a Wellington lobbyist by the name of um, uh, Mark Unsworth. Uh, he took a, a holiday to Vegas, which is fine, he could do that, I don't really care too much. But uh, it was a boys' trip that involved him, the head of New Zealand Post, John Key's chief of staff, and a former National Party cabinet minister. And they were rocking around Vegas, shooting AK-47, <laughs> dropping a $1,000 on the blackjack tables. And, uh, and his Facebook feed was amazing. We were able to, we were able to do a map of Vegas and like chart out hour by hour at the different bars he had gone. And it was great. Because uh, you know, John Key's chief of staff, he, he just doesn't give interviews. And the fact that he was uh, hanging out with uh, the lobbyist for Sky City at the time uh, was somewhat newsworthy. But real questions about who was paying for that trip. And we got to run amazing, great pictures of Vegas showbills. So, real, real public service there for the readers then. I was at the Herald on Sunday. Thanks, Kate. Um, I've got limited sympathy for people who, um, you know, think that they've shared something privately and it comes out, I think, um, Nothing is really private. You know, if you take down the Facebook account, you just reactivate it and it's still there. Every post, every photo, it's not deleted. Um, even on your phone, if you delete something on your phone, whoever you've sent it to may still have it. Uh, if you upload it onto iCloud, all those things. So, um, you know, when you read about celebrities, although the content is, shouldn't be shared, the fact that they've put it on somewhere where it's not really in their grasp anymore. I do have limited some things. It's like, well, you, know, you just shouldn't have done that. So I don't think that it's something that people can really complain about if they're willing to um, use these social media sites for their own personal use and then just assume that it's theirs and it's just going to stay that way because they, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those things, they don't care about you. It's a business. And even Snapchat, when everyone found out that um, it didn't disappear. It was a news story. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, of course it doesn't go away. And if, if you Snapchat it, you know, everyone's like, oh, it's fine, because it tells you that someone's grip screenshotted it. Like, it's fine. It's like, yeah, but they still have it. So all those people that do it, I just, uh, I was just like, you're stupid. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, totally, totally understand. With, um, so, like, with, like, with the, say, Gina Florence case, where she mm. had photos on her phone and her phone got hacked, and she was going on about, you know, if you search the photo, you're um, condoning this illegal act. And yeah. yes, it wasn't, you know, it was hacked. But it's like, uh, just go and see the person that you're going to send them to. Like, just take your clothes off in front of them. <laughs> so famous. <laughs> you know, if you're not famous, then chances of, you know, it being hacked are much more slim. And no one's going to care, except your friends, or, I don't know, even parents, whatever. But, you know, if I was in that world and if I was that famous, yeah. even half, even like, not even, even I just, I would never do that, ever, even if I had no one knew who I was, I had no friends, I would never ever do it, but I was in LA last month and um, I did an um, interview with Paris Hilton and she brought it up and she said, there's no way I'd put anything on the cloud, which I found ironic considering mm -hmm. before that was even a thing, <laughs> we already saw her sex tape, which I'm pretty sure was on a camcorder, so for it to like, jump online, it was just weird, but um, 
yeah, that was quite ironic. But you know, Jennifer Lawrence was doing this whole like, you know, women should fight for women and don't search it. I mean, I'll be honest, I searched it, couldn't find it, but <laughs> just it was just like, well, I'm it. I was like, oh, and then it was this whole, you know, you're a pedophile or whatever if you're looking at it. And I was like, wow, well, it's kind of, eh. I'll probably it'll it'll come to eventually. Like I'll we'll see it one day, but. Like, is there a link? You know, I'm not sure there is. I just wanted to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to have, have, have my little opinion. Again, I, th I think what Amber's saying is right. That, uh, any, anything you write electronically um, effectively is in a sort of a public space. We don't do control. Yeah. <laughs> effectively, any, anything you write down and commit online is, is pretty much in a public space. So it's like pub talk, except unlike pub talk, this shit is carved in stone if you've never been deleted. Um, so just, just think before doing anything stupid. Again, don't dance on the table topless if you don't want anyone, anyone to know about it. I mean, generally, from a media perspective, we won't care about you unless there's a public interest. And to me, that bar is actually quite high, despite the fact I'm sounding like a tablet asshole. I, I do have some standards here. So I mean, I, I, I think so, so civilians don't need to worry so much. It's more, again, the, the finance company chief executives that should really be watching out. Journalists with standards, you hear it do first. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, like teacher, 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 um, I think it says Google before you tweet is a new think before you speak, uh, which is an interesting net safe uh, meme. The, just to take up that point about uh, whether it be celebrities or anyone else, I mean, I think we do need to have some private spaces. The fact, the idea that we have chosen a particular way of communicating and intended that to be private must mean something, surely. Uh, whether it be Snapchat, and you know, yes, you might argue that people should not be stupid enough to think that if they send a picture of themselves as an all black in a shower uh, with their goods hanging out, that it won't be retweeted. But um, as I have blogged, uh, that potentially is actually a breach of our law at the moment on a number of counts. So you do need to be a little bit careful. And I think that if people are choosing a communication method or a storage method with a legitimate expectation of privacy, then it is not, it is not something that we should just ignore and say, well, hey, they put it in the cloud, they put it on the internet in some way, shape, or form, and therefore it's open slather. Now, it's a bit like saying, well, if something's copyright and you put it online, then, hey, it doesn't matter, anyone can grab it. That's not the case. So I think that we do need to make some distinction at least. Yes, be aware that it's going to turn up in one of Matt's very ethical um, reports, but um, just I think there is some observation of privacy. Otherwise, you know, why do we all wear trousers? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's um, so, one of my questions was a little bit more towards men and um, pebbles. Because I don't know about you guys, but like I'm like no one amongst my friends is stalking all future boyfriends of all my friends to find out, you know, whether they're actually going to be good enough. And I'm sure all employers over here would also do a little bit of stalking to see how many friends in common you had with that. So I was actually going to ask for some tips on actually how to do better stalking. <laughs> Just to turn it completely on its head. Well, well, if you've got some money, uh, there's all sorts of records you can pull up. Um, again, I don't know what this concern is over the social media because these privacy concerns have been around for a long time. Again, the, the law around it is a bit more solid than the social media. But I mean, I, the course of my job, I can pull up uh, something called the Personal Property Security Register and see if you've got any active uh, high purchase agreements, uh, any, or basically borrowed. Uh, with security over anything. Um, I've again mentioned old friends, particularly good, you can find out what school people have gone to. Um, it just Google's actually really very good, that's my main investigative tool. I mean, there's a few little tricks you can use, um, site specific searches, site colon, if someone's got a common name, site colon dot nz, we'll just search from New Zealand. Um, and then you can run searches, various image searches. And I find Google search is actually better than Facebook's and a lot of social media sites. So do your site search, facebook.com. Um, you'll find out an awful lot. Again, it, it, you, the only limit the amount of stuff you can find out is how long you're prepared to keep clicking next 10 results. Um, and I mean, I've got to four or five hundred some stories. I mean, this is just some fascinating stuff out there. Um, 
But again, if you want to find something out, you've always got a private investigator. I mean, uh, they just charge three or five hundred bucks to sort of do what I do. Or, of course, if you want me to do it, um, you know, try to go out with a really dodgy bastard and I'll, I'll do it for free. <laughs> Um, I've never really stalked anyone for my personal, well, actually not online, I, I have, but not for like a job or anything, just social entertainment kind of, but my parents who have employed people, my dad's often asked me, he's like, can you just like check this person out and you see who they're friends with and it's just social media, people don't really, I think now people are more concerned about it and more aware that it has implications with employment. Yeah. Um, I have thought in the past, before I started doing Spy Magazine for the Herald on Sunday, I wasn't employed and I did think my Twitter was one of the reasons why I couldn't get a job because it was just rude and, you know, it was pretty bad. And it was like, you kind of a private Twitter account that just defeats the whole purpose of Twitter. Um, same with my Facebook's not so bad, but I did think about that. Um, and then I got the job kind of because of my Twitter, which was ironic, but we, with my dad going back to that, I have looked at things, and some people I've sort of said, oh, I don't know about this person, just it's a retail job, and you see pictures of them messed up, you know, at bars and stuff, and you're like, well, you don't really want to deal with that on Saturday morning, calling saying they've got a migraine and they can't come to work. So there's little things like that that people, I think, do forget about, because part of them want to be really social and look amazing, and they have this really fun life, but then the other part's like, well, that's not going to go with any kind of employment or an employer looking at you thinking, oh, this person is good for one thing and it's not working. Yeah. yeah, so I think it kind of, if you are more serious about being social online, don't think you're going to get a good job out of it maybe, or I don't know, you might, but you probably have to study really hard as well and it's not going to make you very popular. Okay. Yeah, um, just putting on a net safe hat for a moment, um, It'll be interesting to see, and there's some research being done, some longitudinal research being done around what happens when the people who are sharing that sort of shit now get to be the employers. And will they, will their view of, hey, this is not the right person for doing a retail job, have changed by that stage? Because they'll all be going, hey, yeah, like, you know, like some of our parents or some of us may have done, hey, back in whatever, the 90s, like, I was smoking some of that stuff, and you know that would look pretty bad if it, if it got to my employer. Now I think the same thing will happen in terms of social media. You know, the employers once they come through that trend will say, "Well, yeah, we were all there." Maybe, maybe. to create sort of separate doppelganger existences in the public <laughs> is doomed to failure. Um, <laughs> and, and this is the huge problem. If you have a problem with sharing, uh, the only way to not share is really to not post publicly. Um, you know, I, and there's two things I want to cover here. One, um, I've learned a lot in the last couple of weeks dealing with this hacker Rorschach about uh, online <coughs> privacy. And this isn't privacy that you're concerned about, you know, someone knowing that you are out drinking last night. Um, I had to worry about the police knocking down the door. So the, the, I have adopted certain nuclear grade um, privacy measures. Um, for anything that I do now that's uh, somewhat <coughs> sensitive, I'll use a completely different operating system. I'll use a browser that operates through what's called the Tor network. So uh, my, I'll connect to the internet, we'll go into a big 
pool of other people using the same network, it will pop out. No one can connect me to what's popped out. I also use um, uh, PGP encryption, which apparently, I think the NSA can't get through that yet. They will eventually, but then there'll be an even better one. But So, so effectively, I, I need to operate uh, two, li two lives. Anything I want to keep actually secret or private, uh, I have to operate that. And for the rest of it, I mean, I want an online presence. It's, you know, I want to be able to communicate as me. And you can't do that without sharing. So to a certain extent, I've, I've given up that battle. I think it's hopeless, I think it's pointless. You know, if you tried running two accounts, people stalking you would find both and connect the dots, wouldn't they? And so you've just wasted all this time and worry and effort and you haven't really got anywhere. Um, well, I think with how it used to be when we shared information, it was, you know, once a week or in papers and in print and now it's just more immediate. So I feel like in a way, yes, all these separate accounts may be doomed to fail because it is very separate and a lot of people have these different um, personalities online with their versions of themselves which aren't really real and they're all kind of different and sort of a bit shittier than the actual person, even though they think that it's better. But so much shinier. But yeah, I don't know. Some of my friends think so, but no, no. Um, and so basically I think it will either merge into one and become, I don't know, it's I don't know, I should probably like try to invent like it. Yeah, like one big, good, awesome thing. But they're all kind of linking into each other now, because I think initially it would have been much more separate, but now it's all shared. So, you know, a Facebook feed is essentially an entire feed of Instagram photos, and Instagram is now a feed of YouTube video clips, and YouTube is, I don't know, whatever, like vines and all that sort of stuff. It's all kind of linking in together. So, essentially, I guess it's the only way for it to go is just. Merge and come into one big blog. And, yeah, but I think no one's going to give up social media. Yeah, no, 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 it's not. It's, it's, it's staying. So, looking into the future, Rick, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with Matt. Um, uh, just this last week, the internet, um, internet Industry Task Force, the Internet Architecture Board has come out and said that encryption should be default for communi communicating on the internet. So, um, I think Matt is right that there will be. That there is a growing um, demand and a growing acceptance of a separate channel for very private communication, encrypted. Uh, yes, the NSA and so on will be able to get access to that, and there's all sorts of issues around that for law enforcement. But in terms of the social side, I think that um, yeah, it'll it'll just continue on as it is at the moment. And in particular, I say that because you know I was out at um, Naikalani School out in Point England. Uh, earlier this week, and those kids are being educated online. They store everything in the cloud, <coughs> they communicate their lessons in the cloud, they are taught online, both in the school and in their home environments. So to expect them to move offline, out of the cloud, is just a naive expectation. So we are developing our children into online netizens, you know, people who live online. So social, if social won't become social, social will become life. That's very profound. It is. Isn't it? Social will become life. Yeah. And, um, and with that, I might open the floor up for some questions. If anyone has any good ones. We've got some good prizes up for grabs as well. Um, we've got 10 minutes or so. Or I can ask another question unless there's any out there. Oh, sorry, anyone? Yeah. Um, how has sharing and well, how has sharing impacted journalism and columns, and etc., and does it change the content of it at all? Um, well, yes, it probably, it's, in some ways it's quite a bad way. With journalism, I mean, I started my career with The Listener, it wasn't that long ago, I mean, I've been doing it 10 years, uh, but the only real feedback you get from readers back then were letters, and uh, given the demographic there, they were mainly uh, written on typewriter, um, because I think our average age of readers is about 65. Um, however, now um, you get inundated with, with such wonderful hate mail. Oh, it's so much hate mail. So, I mean, you really feel engaged with people that are writing in caps at you. And uh, yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's lovely. Um, but in terms of um, broadly journalism, it, it's made the job a lot faster. It's actually a lot, social media is part, and the internet uh, means I can ferret stuff out through the company's office and build a, a corporate wiring diagram of you know, a whole network of companies connected around a person, who uh, the holding companies are, who runs them, who the directors are, and it's supposed to become a balance. Um, and I've talked to some of the, 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 some of the old sods 
uh, the newsroom, and they actually had to go down to actual the actual company's office. But like, there was a building, and, and they had to open drawers. Uh, and it probably took a couple of hours to find each company's document. So that, that, that's made it a lot better. But in terms of the, the sharing side, as I mentioned before, I mean, I can strip mine enormous amounts of information very, very quickly. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, uh, a friend of mine calls it the, the destruction of practical obscurity, which is what Matt is talking about. The, the idea that you had to go down to the library to look at the microfiche or even beyond that, back at the hard copies of newspapers to find out backstories, or to the company's office and they brought out an old, crusty old file that you had to sit down at a desk and copy, or any of the other places that we used to go for information. Now all the information is no longer practically, practically obscure. It is there at our fingertips. The interesting thing for me about journalists, though, is how quickly you guys need to react. You know, uh, 140 characters forms the basis of the story now. Um, and because you know that your, let's not, let's call it competitors, are uh, seeing the same 140 characters, it seems to me that the uh, that that's accelerated the, the, the way in which you guys need to react, and therefore, you know, to be honest, lower the quality of stories. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. Um, <laughs> no, and, and in all honesty, I mean, the, the news cycle has, has got crazy. Um, during the election campaign, stuff would be breaking. Uh, the the desk, news desk would be expecting updates every hour. Um, and you seem to find one new thing. And often, the easiest place to find that thing was Twitter. It's terrible. Um, I mean, I personally, I mean, I've, I, I can do that sort of stuff. I do it when required. I much prefer breaking stories that wouldn't have happened without me, because we, so that gives me personal satisfaction, that if I wasn't there, something would have gone uncovered, as opposed to being merely one of 10 reporters uh, rewriting the same tweet, which just seems quite redundant. But um, in terms of, I guess, how it works from a PR perspective, um, you know, you can never have time off, <laughs> because if something happens, if you've got uh, clocked off for 10 hours, I mean, the story will have moved through five or six cycles, and the heads will be rolling by the end of that time, I suspect. Um, so yeah, it's increased the, the ability to get information, but also the, uh, the, the speed at which the beast demands more of it to consume. Um, well, that pretty much said all of it. But um, as a columnist, I haven't, I've only been in the job, oh, well, I've done the column since I was 15, but I've been at SPY for not even a year now, and most of the content that we do get is from social media, because it is gossip-based and social media-ish based. So um, it's great because it's immediate, but on the flip side, my deadlines are Friday afternoon because it's out on a Sunday. So often the columns that are throughout the week get it before we do. Um, and it is often the same stories because it all sort of sits in one big pond and festers and then people pick what they want and we all just pick the same stuff. So it is great because it's immediate, but then at the same time, it you know can get a bit stale. But in terms of my own personal social media, um, I recently, well today, I found out that I got voted the most irritating Aucklander in Metro magazine. So, um, and, so um, that was through my social media and that was because um, you probably all heard about the Glassons mannequin saga. And I just was like, it's fucking stupid. And everyone was like, you're fucked. And it was so stupid. And then I just decided I'll reply to these people and Oh, it was the worst decision I ever made, but now I've got, I've got a title, so it's kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Have we got one down here? Oh, I'd love it, Matt. To answer this question. Um, social media for journalists, and, and um, what is news these days? How can you, what would you define as news? If you, if you turn on the TV, what do you want to see? What, what intrigues you? What is news these days? What is news to me, or what is news full stop? Well, both. Uh, well, uh, what is news full stop is basically whatever my bosses tell me, uh, which is a nice, easy, safe question that will still see me employed next week. Um, in terms of what is news to me, um, you know, there's this nebulous concept of public interest, and that is quite distinct from what the public is interested in, because the public is interested in all sorts of shit um, that just isn't worth the time of day in my mind. I mean, people are. I mean, just I mean, I watch some. some I read some shitty novels. You know, but um, I would want to write them. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is the news to me is uh, something that no one knows and something that's interesting, I guess is the easiest way to put it. I mean, my main focus, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I should have worn my suit, but I'm actually a business reporter. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I've uh, sometimes forgotten I'm going to call in a show like this, saying, hey, the judges, it's good times. Um, so from that perspective, broadly, it's about uh, you know, the movement of large amounts of money, which can sound quite um, venal and Wall Streety. Um, once you break it down to a million bucks, it's sort of put into about 10 people's jobs. Then some like three stealing three people's pensions. Stealing people's pensions. I've done so many stories about pensions being stolen. Yes, and so, I mean, again, that's something people don't know about, and I found it really interesting. And I hope uh, the readers did too. This one's for men as well. Uh, is or has social media killed journalism, or is it just a matter of adapting? Uh, it's it's made it difficult actually, to be honest. Uh, we're no longer the me old media orgs are no longer like the sole providers of new information. People can often see stuff breaking before we can. I mean, one of the strongest memories I had of this happening was um, during the Christchurch quakes. I was actually uh, on the phone to a contact. I was doing a lot of digging around Terry Serapisos at the time, and was on you know some some debt collector in Christchurch. I was talking to about the next court action that was in bankrupt, and it was awesome. Uh, and then he said, "Oh, it's shaking," and then the phone cut off, and I didn't talk to him for a couple of days. Um, so that was quite frightening. But you could see. News of that was breaking, I could see on Twitter, faster than, than we could put it up at NBR. And NBR is a ridiculous operation. I mean, I was allowed to post stories directly to the web. They had no sub-editors, no web editors. It was just, you just challenge shit. And still, you couldn't beat Twitter. Um, so that, that's made it quite challenging. So you have to, I think, again, it's a matter of adapting. Um, often we can't provide that first, you know, tweeted pick like we could before when we had 24 hours before the um, you know, news cycle rolled around and you bung on the front page of the paper, people can see that straight away. So we need to add more. And we need to give, sort of give, give context, put it into perspective. Yes, use some of those initial quotes to start off with, but we need to tell like, the whole story. And we have to do it bloody fast. legal question. Um, I have a reputation that Fairfax has been the most expensive journalist in the building because of all the legal advice I needed. So I think I'm quite actually well placed to answer this. Um, with global, it, you sort of know it when you see it and if something's really lowest, you generally don't run it or at the very least you put in a call for comment. I mean the advantage of online publishing is that you can update a story as it goes, right? So you would then you write to publish straight away and then update it as soon as you can. So the story rolls but I mean, there's people defame each other all the time. Um, from a practical standpoint, you only really worry, worry about rich people. It's terrible, but that, that's sort of how it rolls. You have to, I mean, which makes business stories actually the hardest ones to do, because the people you're writing about are the ones most likely to take you to court. Um, which doesn't mean you'll be callous to everyone else. Um, but, uh, yeah, the legal question, it, it is really, really hard. Often the advantage you've got with social media is often you've got people's own words. Again, I was mentioning, it's the pub chat, it's the pub chat written in stone. That, that never dies. And you can easily check back and it's, you're not sort of relying on someone's drunk half remembering to the next day saying, I think they told me that. So that's hearsay. Social media is direct <laughs> testimony often. I mean, the other thing is also that the barriers to entry into journalism disappeared with free blogs and that kind of stuff. But actually, my question was going to be around the, um, the right to be forgotten that you have in the EU now. The, um, do, you, do you think that really kind of works or? Will come here, or is it practical? It's crazy talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, question for those who didn't hear it was about the right to be forgotten, uh, which is in the EU. Uh, interestingly enough, we, we actually have a right to be forgotten here as well. Uh, our Privacy Act requires holders of personal information to get rid of that information so long as it is no longer necessary for them to hold it. Not many people do that, of course, because who, who the hell deletes information? Hey, it's so easy to store. But we do have that. So my, my take on that is technically impossible, obviously. Uh, and Google, Google, of course, is not deleting the original information. It is deleting the links to the information, uh, which most people uh, certainly don't uh, pick up on. But the interesting thing from my perspective is that the people who want that are deciding, 
deciding for us, or the, the lawmakers who are deciding their case, which came out of Spain, uh, are deciding that they want to give to Google, a commercial organisation who, whose concept of what is evil may be quite different from yours and mine, the right to censor the internet in a non-transparent, non-accountable way. And I think that is a terrible, terrible answer. You know, it's, many of us might say it's bad enough to give the government the right to censor the internet. Certainly some of my clients might say that in terms of the chief censor. But um, to give it to a commercial organisation, terrible answer. And you can see that already in terms of how Google is dealing with some of this, in terms of people who just don't want their history because they are ex-criminals or they've done something wrong. They are the ones who are asking Google to remove their information, which is a crazy result. Yeah, I mean, you want everyone to forget something. I mean, it's, it's, it's all very close to excising history. And I just sort of wonder how far people want it to go. I mean, I understand, yes, we've got clean slate legislation here, so you know, minor criminal convictions get forgotten after seven years. But um, we also need to, I think, have a wee bit of faith in people to understand that you know, minor things a long time ago, even if they can be found out about, are minor things a long time ago. I mean, you can't just uh, expect to wipe everything. And I mean, it, again, I'm a, you know, I, I write things, I write things down. <laughs> I rely on reading. I'll often I do stories that involve reading things that are old. I'd hate to think that someone's that have gone through some sort of ministry of information and, and excise bits that someone didn't want. I mean, it's it's an anathema to, to what I, to what I believe in. Um, my question was actually based about two questions ago, and you've kind of already talked about it, but I just wanted to hear a little bit more. Um, reputation management, because it's it's a virgin industry internationally, which if anyone's not familiar with. It, it's essentially where you hire a company to rebrand and push out of search results anything bad about you or anything that built, and conversely maybe uh, ensure that things that are bad about your competitors get pushed up. And um, it's a legitimate business and it's really huge overseas. It's not so big here, but I just was curious about your opinions because obviously it intersects between both personal, legal and social um, outcomes, I guess, in the mind. Just curious. Yeah, I've run into that a couple of times. Often when I write about scammers, so, uh, <laughs> there's been a couple of funny ones where I sort of write a story. Here's a, here's a guy with a dodgy financial background, multiple convictions, multiple bankruptcies, and he's trying to sell, he's trying to sell you a, 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 a $28,000 foreign exchange trading software that will, that will lose all the money you put into it straight away. <coughs> it's, it's an amazing business, and I name the business and say, you know, basically say, don't, don't go there. Um, and so a month later, they started a new company with a new name and rebrand, um, and so I've got another story. And eventually they get tired of this, and then they try this reputational management business, and it's hilarious because it's outsourced. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I've seen blogs written in their names by people who can't really speak English. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the tenses are all wrong, and, it, and it's a joke. Um, and it doesn't really work, to be honest. I mean, I mean, I guess you can spend a lot of money and make it work. Are you but referring to that doesn't work because there's not terribly good at your job? Because I know people who do it and they actually do it. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe it could work if they spend proper money on it. I mean, the people I've seen use it uh, terribly have been like, quite low rent. Um, <laughs> I guess if you're a corporation going to bury something. But I mean, the media companies and substantial stories have this quite a lot of weight mm -hmm. on mine. It takes a lot to drown them out. And often, if you pissed off people that led to that first story, they'll be quite annoyed to see that result sliding down. And so you get sort of a vigilante guerrilla operation to counter counteract your, your bizarre SEO burying. I mean, it's, it's just bizarre. I mean, it's not like something out of a William Gibson novel, to be honest. I <coughs> Basically, I think it's. It's the internet. It's fun, it's not fun, I suppose, but it's it's the internet reacting in a way to a story on the internet. You know, use the internet to combat the internet. Uh, so yeah, all fair and love of war. It's part of the bag of tricks that you know. If I've got a client like that, that yeah, we may well use. You know, threatening bank with defamation, sending a notice of takedown notice to get it time to get the ISP to take it down. Bit of reputation management bit of, uh, what else, what, what, any of the other tools that we can think of, hey, you know, use the tools that are there. I'm not suggesting for a moment that's wrong. Just that, you know, you've got to be aware the internet will route around them. That's what the internet was designed for, to route around barriers. I've got a question for all three of the panelists. And uh, what Britt mentioned alludes to 
when the internet first started, uh, people were talking about how the, in, that the power was now going back to consumers and individuals. In the recent years, we've seen, and, and corporates and governments were quite afraid of that. In recent years, we've seen a bit of a transition where it would appear that corporates and governments are starting to understand how to, how, how to push back against individuals. Do you see that as, do you see that happening, and do you see that as a positive or negative thing? Um, I, uh, it's kind of a hard question. Um, I think that years ago, if you were to tell people that they would have the freedom that they do have now on the internet, people would just have, wouldn't be able to fathom it because it's, we do have so much freedom. Um, in saying that, I think um, there are some restrictions, but essentially it's just, it's such a vast networking place that it, you can't really censor it, you can't really push against people, they'll always find a way around it. So part of me really loves the internet. I think it's like the biggest revolution ever. But um, I think in corporate scenarios, I mean, it's different, but in my world, it's just, I don't know, I just can't imagine life without it. I just think it's the platform where you can say anything and do anything. And it's sort of, you know, if someone, if someone is going to try and restrict you, it's the place where you can sort of voice yourself more so than in any other place um, because it's free. So, yeah, I don't think it does. Yeah, um, it's, social media allows a lot of uh, amazing interaction. You saw, um, I guess, uh, particularly in the Middle East, in the Arab Springs. I mean, didn't they call uh, when they toppled Mubarak, you know, the Facebook revolution? Which, which sounds wonderful, except for the fact if you were living there at the time posting anti mubarak <laughs> slogans, you've got the same tools I can use to find out who you are and where you live. And other. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're you know, secret police in the tens of thousands. And we've seen this in other cases too. I mean, it can literally be used to prosecute thought crime. You know, if you're blogging what you think, if you're posting what you think, um, you can be identified very quickly as a possible threat. I mean, it's, it's, it's open and it's information and they can easily be misused and it's quite frightening. I think um, the recent protest out in Hong Kong, there was a news of a, a certain sort of surreptitious app that was, you know, marketed as, you know, oh, from the protest organisers, when in fact it appears to lead directly back to the Chinese government. Um, so, you know, this secure messaging between protesters was just being routed straight to Beijing, which, which is quite frightening. Um, and, yeah, it's... Well, sensible for the Beijing government, perhaps, but um, not for those, you know, uh, believers in, in truth and justice and uh, open democracy. Um, so I think we need to push back on that as much as we can. You know, there is I mean, a certain amount of sharing, of uh, sort of commercial sharing, I think, is inevitable. But in cases where it's interfering with people's liberty and safety, we have to be quite vigilant and sort of uh, kick the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, you've got people like the FBI coming out and criticising. Facebook and uh, Apple for encrypting uh, by default. So there is a real tension there between people's desire for privacy, particularly against the state, uh, and the rights or the, the needs of law enforcement to be able to track people, to be able to pick up uh, evidence at a later stage. So yeah, it's going to be a tension and that pendulum will keep, keep swinging. And sometimes it goes too far one way and sometimes it just comes back the other way. At the moment, I think, because of the revelations of Snowden and Greenwald and so on, the pendulum is starting to swing back against that sort of invasive, by default, scrutiny of us all. group. I mean, you can now connect with people of your interests, 
your community now that, that you couldn't do before. So I mean, I think, yeah, on the whole, it's positive. It's got, you know, there's some massive teething problems, but uh, you know, we should be a sort of most of them. I agree. I think it's better, but I still think we're just getting a bit neurotic now. But other than that, we've just got a platform to find like-minded people to, you know, be around, and even if it's just via social media, it's kind of a good thing. So I think it. Sorry, I was going to say something about cats, but uh, I went away from that. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, as a, as a lawyer, um, one wouldn't expect me to live online, but I do. I love Twitter, I live there, I get clients from Twitter, so from a commercial perspective, hey, it's absolutely a good thing to do. And from a social perspective, it's fun, I learn things, I impart knowledge to other people, why would I not do that? Can I get the microphone back? Um, just to, sorry, we are just out of questions, but you can come talk to these guys later. Um, what I sort of came out of this one was that sharing is good, which I wasn't expecting, which is awesome. I was like, I love sharing. Um, the other thing, which is probably quite interesting to think about, is that all of us here in this room are actually part of making these sort of rules and guidelines and putting pressure on whoever we need to. Because I think in a, probably a hundred years' time, there's actually going to be probably some quite strict rules, whereas at the moment it is quite nebulous. And it's, that's quite a cool thing to realise that we've actually probably got a bit of a responsibility and an opportunity to make it how we want it to be. That was sort of what I took out of tonight. And I hope that you guys all took out something equally as cool and important. And um, that's Mackle for 2014. We just need to draw some prizes. I was going to pass it over to Vaughan. Did you choose any? Oh, okay. I want to say something. Hi. Um, hi, hi. Hi, Adrian. When, when you talked a bit about, wasn't you great? Wasn't it well done? Yeah. Big round of applause. Um, when you talked about the Snackle Committee and the Snackle Committee the same way as the club is a club, which is not really. Um, it's just a loose group of, ooh, I don't even know how many, five to 12 people who meet virtually to decide how this thing works. And the reason I'm having this spiel right now is if you're sitting here and you're going, oh, I've got a great idea for what could be a good panel next year, then you've got 90% of what it takes to run an event as many as next year. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not shitting. It's, it's, we, two years ago, we sat around the pub table and we spent... I don't know, a good 10 minutes, um, working hard to make this as easy as possible for anyone. Was it easy? Was it, it easy? very easy. Lots and of help. Yeah. Okay, all, it wasn't easy, but there's lots of help. <laughs> yeah, all you, oh, we've got, we've got a great venue sponsor, thank you Vodafone. We've got a great financial sponsor, thank you Oracle for the pizzas. We've got plenty of booze. All you need is an idea and three great panelists like we had tonight. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking, I could do this, you can. It's really, really easy. So go to the Snapple website, get in touch with us, and uh, we'll make it happen. Honestly, seriously. And the, the other thing is, we try not, as a committee, to take more than one go at it each year. So it doesn't become the Wendy Show, or the Vaughan Show, or the Adrian Show, or whatever. So if you want to go, it's, it's sort of open slander. Uh, my favorite question was the one about uh, right to be forgotten. What does it win? Oh, I've got a... A prize. Thank you. A prize. <laughs> Speak it um, AUT actually. So I come and see me after something else, sort that one out. Also, Jan, did you have some winners or are you doing that via Twitter? Um, are you notified people via Twitter? Twitter? You've got two? Yeah. Do you, want, do you want us to talk about them now? Yeah, I'll just announce it. I'm going to be here. Um, Kiwi Diva, how are you? Yeah, thanks for showing your legs on Twitter so we can see you on the screen. Um, so you got the few months, which we will talk later. And um, DC Smith, Dale Smith, and Zed, if you're here. Yay! Okay, I'll talk to you later. Thanks. And just finally, a huge round of applause, please, for our amazing panelists. People. Stay for a little while, finish off with some drinks.
got a thing of alcohol left and my daughter didn't come home last night with my car, so I don't want to take it home because I don't have a car. Get out there and do the shit out of the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Just take it all, I don't care. I'm not taking it home. Drink all the alcohol, share all the photos afterwards. And then also we tend to go across the road to Sofitel when the lights go out, so do feel free to join us across the road there. I think we get two point drinks.